That must be the ambition of the Caribbean and the Caribbean and the Caribbean. Welcome to this week's edition of the Open World Podcast. We have Professor Clive Thomas with us here. Today we're going to uh, divert a little bit from our usual discussion about uh, Guyana and go a little to our wider Caribbean. Uh, in the, at the last meeting, the CARICOM heads of government announced that uh, they would, from next year, be opening uh, movement of people within the CARICOM region uh, for all, uh, all categories. Uh, prior to that, we know that um, uh, the movement was restricted to people with uh, degrees, from the University of the West Indies, certain uh, professionals and so forth. No, it seems that from next year, all Caribbean people will be able to move uh, within the CARICOM region. Now that of course uh, has consequences. Uh, when they move, what about education? Will they be able to access education? Will they be able to access healthcare? Those are all things that uh, would come with this new initiative. Many people have hailed it as uh, a good step forward for our region. As you know, we've been grappling and trying with uh, uh, Caribbean integration, going back at least to the Federation in 1958 to 1962. And for those who've been working tirelessly to bring us closer together as a region, this must be uh, a landmark decision, so long as we're able to keep the schedule that um, the heads of government have announced. I'd like to welcome all of you to Politics 101, uh, our podcast, our open world podcast um, edition of Politics 101, wherever you're joining us from, whether you're joining us from Guyana, the wider Caribbean, you're joining us from North America or Europe, or right here uh, in South America, across the border in Suriname, French Guyana. All of you Guyanese and non-Guyanese, welcome to, the, to today's podcast, Professor Clive Thomas. We're gonna be talking about uh, uh, what is the meaning of this new announcement that uh, all categories of people, all categories of labor, I guess the economists would say, could now move freely within our Caribbean. What does this mean for Caribbean integration? And um, since we are operating out of Guyana, what does it mean for Guyana? Guyana, as you know, um, uh, has changed in terms of its economic outlook. However we twist it, however we turn it, the fact of the matter is that we have oil, we are exporting oil, and that puts us in a different category. Only this past week, um, uh, I think the World Bank announced that Guyana has now moved out of the category of poor countries, and um, we have moved into the high, high income category now. Um, so um, these things, uh, things are moving in spite, despite um, all the difficulties that we have. We also had the opposition leader announcing that uh, the APNU has now embraced the Buxton proposal, which was put forward by Professor Clive Thomas on behalf of the WPA in 2018. Uh, he proposed it in Buxton at the EUC Quayana uh, 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 annual uh, symposium, and it's been five years. And uh, this past Sunday at a rally in Georgetown, finally the APNU has embraced it. Uh, uh, the leader of the opposition, Aubrey Norton, announced it. So there's a lot happening 
on uh, the uh, economic front, and we'll try to get Professor Thomas to weigh in on some of them. But the focus today is on uh, uh, the movement of labor, uh, all categories of labor throughout the Caribbean. Let's bring in Professor Clive Thomas. Professor Thomas, uh, how are you? Many thanks, David. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Um, you, you have been, uh, I would say, one of the pioneers as far as uh, scholar activists are concerned. <clears throat> We've been working on Caribbean integration. We have um, spoken on this program about it from time to time. And um, some of the earlier studies and the later studies you've been involved with. When you got the news that uh, uh, there is likely next year to be movement of labor uh, for all categories of people in the Caribbean, what was your re response? Well, to begin with, um, I didn't think that it was just likely. I took it as a, as a dumb fact. So I'm working the presumption that um, this will become a reality not later than March next year, as they themselves said at the heads of government meeting that was held in Trinidad and Tobago. One of the aims behind any integration movement, although this was not the case at the beginning of the CARICOM or the CARICOM movement, when we, were, myself and Dr. Booster, who has since died, were asked to prepare a document, given some guidance as to how they might oppose the um, integration of the Caribbean region. And we wrote that book, which is called The Dynamics of West Indian Economic Integration. And that book argued that the purpose of an integration movement within the region is in effect to create a single homogeneous market, not only for goods and services, but for the factors of production, which would include labor, so labor capital services, so the free movement of all of these things will become part and parcel of the West Indian reality. So in effect, what we are creating is a single state in an economic sense among the West Indian countries. And that is basically the aim of all integration movements. There was an original theory which still remains in the textbooks by trade theorists in, in, West, in the Western world that free trade the free movement of goods and services will lead to the equalization of the prices of the factors of production in the region that is practicing free trade. That it can substitute the movement of goods and services can in effect substitute for the actual movement of the factors of production. Our thesis is that the markets of the West Indian states are so small so disaggregated that that freedom of movement had to take place as well of the factors of production if you were to create an effect of single state in terms of economic dimension. And you could not leave that in the markets to generate by just um, creating free and free trade. You had to do it with as well by bringing the factors of production into play. And so we've always championed the view that we should have some movement of labor, some free movement of capital, some free movement of the trade and services, because that's very different from goods. And that on that basis, that is how we will develop the economies in a collective and harmonious way so that we benefit from the economies of scale, which is necessary for all competitive production in this world today. So from that point of view, the movement towards the clearing up of the market impediments through barriers to trade, through restrictions by governments is very welcome. And I would hope that by March next year, we have as much as we can practically do. But I'm also a realist and I realize that we have special circumstances here in the region, which would make it practically a very difficult, difficult thing to do. Because while we're a small region, all the countries are small, there's significant variations in our size, including population-wise. Some states are so small that the best description of them should be micro rather than, rather than small states because they 
are so tiny in effect. Like say some islands can fit in the Essequibo River, but it's just one river in Guyana, one of the three main rivers. So mm -hmm. the disparity in size, the disparities in population are stark, even within the West Indian region. And we have to regulate trade and, and the movement of the factors of production to compensate for that. For example, in a medical service or whatever any other business, you might need four or five specialists in one country. If you entirely free up the market for that type of specialist labor, any one of the bigger countries would be able to supply all that labor. Mm -hmm. So that means you're giving no support to the creation of indigenous development for your own people. So governments tend to naturally want to resist that happening. So we believe in the planned and coordinated movement towards the wider and wider freer movement of persons. So I welcome the decision, but I think that it doesn't end the need for us to plan and to project and to carefully monitor the freedom of movement so that we do it within the capacity of the region, the region's individual states, recognizing that they vary. They vary because of geography. They vary because of history. They vary really de facto. You can't avoid it. And some of them are too small to just absorb the this economies or the difficulties that are created, the difficulties that are created by the free movement of labor. Because the free movement of labor within or any part of the world creates dis disruptions. Even in the big United States, there's big differences between what might be happening in the northeastern United States and what might be happening in the um, deeper parts of the southwest. Um, the, the, the states, even though theoretically there's one market and there's freedom of movement, um, it's difficult to ensure that the factor prices and the availability of opportunities are so equal that you can turn the blind eye to it. So, so the, in fact, in a country like the United States, the, that is built in the, it's called the United States because it's built in the foundation of states. So each state itself would have to put in place mechanisms and laws and arrangements to ensure that this free movement that can take place within the national territory does not disadvantage the particular state. We would have to do the same thing in the Caribbean region if you are to get the best out of the free movement of labor. P Professor, yeah. I, I, sorry, go ahead. I thought you were finished. No, I was about to say, in effect, creating a United States of the West Indies. Yes, yes, and there's actually um, a calypso sung by the mighty bomber Called the United yeah, States. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. And and uh, Professor, I notice you use the word planned and not regulate. Um, is, is that intentional? Uh, and, and is there a difference between a, a, a planned operation and, and regulating um, the movement of people? Well, the two have elements. When I say planned, it has elements of regulation. Mm -hmm. Because the point that I want to convey is that. Um, we can't rely on the market stimuli to achieve this result. It would not happen naturally. The governments, which are the strongest institutions in the region, by far, and who do not fall for the pretense of the private sector that they can deliver development or they can guarantee that the states have achieved the level of economic well-being that they are capable of, you need a government to be able to do that. That is a de definite reality that we've come across. So we have to put the government as a purposeful actor in all these um, arrangements because the market itself is not strong enough, competitive enough, far-reaching enough to guarantee that the outcome will be efficient and effective and fair. If you leave it to the market alone, you'll get um, you know, wide um, disparity in the outcome. And if that occurs, then people will turn against the movement of labor 
and call for its abandonment. And the worst thing we can have is to turn back the clock. Once we haven't taken this step, I think it's very important that we don't have to reverse it. So I would advise a really serious and studious and really calculated approach towards the free movement of labor. I, and I think also it recognizes the significance of Guyana being in a situation with oil. Because the biggest growth in the labor market for the region will be Guyana. And that is not oil employment because the oil itself will not employ so many people. But the multiply effect or the linkages effect or both of them will generate so much employment that we must find a means of ensuring that the Caribbean nationals who by history and everything, everything else, culture, every, his, what, everything else that I can think of, deserve it, should be primary beneficiaries of our windfall gains in fighting oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor, I'm, I'm glad you went there because I was going to go there later. Um, uh, there, there is a view in the Eastern Caribbean countries, the OECS countries, that this shift towards the free movement of labor would see a, a flocking of people to the shores of those quote-unquote mini-states um, in the first instance. Do you share that view? Well, I, I share that view to some extent. But I think one of the countries where that might have been stimulated from Guyana now finds itself with a demand for labor. Yes. So to some extent, the dynamics of the populations in the Caribbean region now favor that type of movement. Because Guyana is no longer a supplier of labor, we are demander for, of labor. We want people to come to Guyana to help to fill needed jobs and so forth. That will be the outcome that will eventually manifest itself. But they will come in not just to work in oil, because the oil employment is not so many persons. I think right now we probably employ less than 5,000 people directly in oil. Many people don't know that. Mm -hmm. So the growth and the expansion of oil depends on what the oil industry purchases locally, whether it's the markets or other companies providing them with services. And through the linkages they create as a result of that, as well as the people in the oil industry who are earning salaries and income and making profits and so on the businesses, what they spend that creates an income multiply effect on the rest of the economy and generates jobs. So the Process. jobs will be more direct, more indirect than direct. Than direct. Directly direct. created, yeah. Yes, Professor Clive Thomas here, we're talking today about uh, uh, the free movement of all categories of labor that is slated to come um, on stream next year, 2024, as announced by the heads of government at the recent CARICOM meeting. Uh, it was the 50th uh, anniversary, yeah. The 50th anniversary of, um, of, 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 of CARICOM. Professor, some, a, a practical question. Lots of the people who are watching this program are all over the Caribbean, Guyanese all over the Caribbean. And, uh, and I, I want to ask, when this thing is formally uh, put in place, what changes the next day for people who have already been migrating to all parts of the Caribbean, Jamaicans moving to Antigua, Antiguans moving to Barbados, Guyanese moving to Antigua. What changes for these people the next day? Well, people who are already, move, already moving freely. Yes. Nothing changes. Okay. Except that they have a legal right to residence. They satisfy the regulations by law. And therefore, they have an entitlement. They're not here at the, at the good wishes of the immigration department. They're here as a consequence of being a citizen in, in, of the Caribbean region. 
of the, of the West Indian Federations of the CARICOM. So they are here as an entitled citizen. And that's a difference from being um, just a visitor. And it's an important psychological difference because it gives you roots in the society. It makes you feel that you have a right to be here. And I think it stimulates the contributions you can make to the society in its development. Because don't, don't underestimate it. The most creative and productive of our people tend to migrate because of lack of opportunities here at home. So we, by my, welcoming migrants, are welcoming some of the cream of the crop in the West Indian region. The because some countries, some countries live on that. They yes. guarantee free movement to the entrepreneurs just coming in. Guarantee them a livelihood, guarantee, guarantee them citizenship. Because they know what the spirit of entrepreneurship brings with it. By, from people who have migrated and done so legally and voluntarily. And what they can bring to their own societies when they come to that spirit of innovation and adventure. And, and, and so therefore the psychological is very important. It's like very it's, important. It's, it's very important. But I also, have, I also have another sneaky ambition because mm -hmm. we used to suffer so much in the hard times. I've always felt that Guyanese who were allowed in the many countries of the great um, reluctance on their part in the rest of the Caribbean region. That we should show by our example that we were better than they were willing to beat us. I feel that is the way in which we teach ourselves and the way in which we learn going forward. I would not like to engage in tit for tat. I was a privileged um, person in the region because most people would recognize my face. As soon as I got to the airport, my name is known in every Caribbean island. Yes. So I never had any problems with immigration at any time. I was always treated first class. And I always envy the fact that um, if we got an opportunity, we should treat people differently because I've seen and been to the airports when people beg me to do this for them, that for them, because they're finding it difficult to get in the country and to even get past immigration. It was a horror story when Guyana was um, almost banned from the rest of the Caribbean. Yes, 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 yes. And the point that you make there um, of um, treating our fellow Caribbean brothers and sisters um, differently is very, 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 very important. Professor, the universal movement of, 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 of labor would mean that services will have to be integrated as our education yeah, yeah. Healthcare. Talk us through that. Well, services are a very diff difficult thing to integrate because services are usually delivered in the person. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will imply the movement of the person. But some countries would buy a service, but they don't want to buy the person who supplies the service or the enterprise. That surprises its service in their own country. Tourism is our best example of that type of trade. Many people, I think the primary service in this export in this region is tourism. And tourism really means that we advertise the islands and the other countries in the CARICOM region, Suriname, Guyana, as tourist um, destinations. And the tourist comes here and buys the service here. That is the facilities we offer, whether it be entertainment, whether it be restaurants, transportation, whatever it is. And that's how the service is paid. And we get a lot of income from that type of um, trade in services. In fact, some islands depend primarily on that as a means of um, creating livelihoods. So that is a very important part. But trade, but trade and services have become even more complex and complicated. Because right now I can work for a firm in the United States without leaving my computer desk and talking at here. 
and I can sell my service without being in the United States or even so I don't physically have to move and I can transfer my skills to deliver a product to whoever wants to buy it over there. So services have become more complex and more complicated and I mean, it has grown remarkably since the 2000s. But prior to that, this was the marginal part of overall trade. But now it dominates, ex expertise dominates the trade in many, many countries. So you can buy a banking service from Guyana, anywhere in the world, that the regulations permit you to buy it from. You can buy a book anywhere in the world and read it online, you don't even ever physically see the book. Trading services have become extraordinarily complex. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a separate category of trade from the trade most persons learn as textbooks early, but they're trading goods. Although they call it trading goods and services, most of our early trading and trade is on goods, sugar, bauxite, timber, things like that. Mm -hmm. But the growth and services has been very rapid. And, and in almost every sector of life. Yeah. The people who buy medical services, <coughs> you don't have to go to, to a hospital in Brooklyn. You can buy the medical services online. Yeah. Yeah. Professor, let me ask you this. Um, it may be a little futuristic, but I think it's a question that must come into play. We don't have a single currency. The OECS has a single currency. Um, but the rest of us uh, in the CARICOM region, we have our own currencies. Um, how does this uh, free movement of labor uh, uh, press uh, the question of a, a single currency? Well, I think ultimately the exchange rates will but we have to be harmonized and then they would evolve, I think, into mm -hmm. a single CARICOM currency. Um, it could be like the euro, and then the national currencies remain, but they, there's a single currency which trades in the market, ah. and which becomes the anchor on which the other currencies um, hang themselves. Even though, because Europe has a single currency, the euro, but the euro doesn't necessarily circulate in every country. If you go to Britain, you deal mainly in pounds. But the euro is very important to um, trade in Europe. Or you would have dealt in pounds if Britain was still a member of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And I think a couple of the Scandinavian countries also um, have, uh, have one. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, um, that's what's happened in the Caribbean, the small islands. Right. Could not afford central bank because these are costly establishments. So they unified um, their efforts across seven states and created the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was I was a speech giver at the, at the launch of that. Right, 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 right. Professor, as usual, we, 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 we want to tease our, our, our next topic. Um, over the weekend, the opposition leader announced that um, APNU has uh, finally embraced the Buxton proposal as, as a policy. Your initial reaction? I'm happy for that. It might encourage me to make a third attempt to revise it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Well, I think, you know, as time has passed, it needs some some modification, not in not in any fundamental principle, but to deal with the time that has passed, and to deal with the different stage at which production has reached in Guyana. Because remember, when it first came out, we hadn't yet even agreed. Um, the companies were not yet admitting we had more than three million barrels of oil. Yeah. So I, in that document, I estimated we had thirteen to fifteen. And based my predictions on that, and now they admitted 12. 
and the government yeah. has put out 24 or 25 because i see two different figures quoted by them in their advertisements for the public auction so you can see how much time has moved on uh, although it's not a long time but how much has moved on in a short period of time because we found the oil in 2019 december we started our first production December 2019, and this is yeah. um, just three full years, 2021, 2022. Yeah. Even I did not anticipate we would move from being where we were, the least developed country, or low developed country, to a high income country in such short a space of time. But I think that um, that could be misleading, though, because they um. Figure the base large and GDP output. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm glad you said that. I don't know if you saw the exchange between um, uh, uh, Professor Gampat and uh, one of the young propagandists from the PPP, Joel Bagundin, and Professor Gampat's um, uh, 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 letter um, pointing out that some of the figures. Um, and he did, he did, he did, he did, he did reference you in his letter that some of the oh, figures yeah. that these young economists uh, supporting the government mm -hmm. are using might <laughs> be misleading. Did you see that exchange? No, I didn't see it. Um, but I have, I've, I've taken all the clipping. Oh, you've taken it out. It's quite interesting. Next week we can, we can. I, talk I know Van Patti used to be the statistician at the United Nations. Oh, right, a very right, distinguished right. person, very senior person too. I think yes. he dedicated his whole life to that. He came here after he uh, after he retired. Yes, I knew me yes. the next one scholar. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, when he referenced you, I, 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 I kind of smiled because I know that you are you are a stickler for for updating. Uh, accuracy, you don't play with that at all. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was telling if, if you say I said so, show me it, show me it in print. Yes, yes, and so I, I, I smiled when I saw that. Um, uh, one other thing I want to get a quick response for you from your your colleague, um, brother Yusiko, and our colleague, um, uh, did a quiet thing this past week in that he chided. Um, I think an Exxon uh, official who was talking about all the big investment of the oil company uh, and insinuating that guy is not investing in, in, in typical Guyana. And he said, well, Guyana is the biggest investor because the oil belongs to Guyana. Um, and of course, um, the other side, I don't think had a, an answer to that. Your quick comment on that. Well, the, the, the point is, as we know from the PSCF, that's what I was telling you originally. Yeah. It was pushed as a part of a progressive agenda. Yeah. That the ownership of the oil would remain. Because prior to that, what investors would come in and do is explore for the oil. And when they found it, own the land and everything, and, yeah. and wherever it was found. But what we signed on to was the PSA, which allows us to own the oil and to hire operators to operate the oil. So, and that is why I said it's necessary for us to have a national company. That's right. Because by having a national company generated out of the ownership, we are party to the decisions that are being made. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we don't expose ourselves to the presumption yeah, that yeah. mission starts when the oil is discovered, and and whoever is producing it they are the entitled appropriators of the benefit. Yeah, because yeah. we would be the company produce part, and the company is producing it. Right. I think we have a simple solution. I don't know why the government does not even encourage any discussion of that. All those criticisms will disappear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor Clive Thomas here, and I, 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 I smiled, Professor, again when I, I think Dr. Randolph Passat could not respond to Kwayana, and I said, you know what, 
what 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 is missing here because we don't have a national oil, oil company they don't because they're not trained in economics or we, we are trained in political science and so on you know if, if there was a national company we can wrap our head around the concept that guyana is an investor but in the absence of a national oil company we feel as though the only investors are the others that are coming in um and i i i think it's just a lack of trade. and i think it's a strategic move for us to do that yes yes it's like psych- yes. an important psychological move yes and it's a real move too because companies are governed by company law 90 percent of the time they have to operate in a national environment that, that's true and in the international environment but really what's supposed to guide their behavior is company law because that's where they're registered on now. Yeah. That's where they operate and that's what has to give them guidance. So we should not abandon that opportunity. Right. Professor Clive Thomas, thank you very much for coming through again this week. And uh, um, as usual, um, next week when we come back, we are going to open up some of the issues that we have teased at the end of the program. Uh, the, the whole question of uh, uh, the uh, cash transfers and as they are linked to poverty and so forth next week. Thank you, Professor. You mentioned it, David. Always happy. And thank you all for staying with us through another uh, edition of our podcast, but don't don't disappear because immediately after this podcast, we're going to have part two of our politics 101, which uh, is going to be our normal uh, uh, commentary and discussion. Today, of course, we are having what they call uh, in sports a double header. Uh, starting off with this discussion uh, with Professor Thomas. And then immediately after this, we are going to um, go into part two of our discussion of uh, politics, on politics 101. So don't go anywhere. Part two is coming up. From the same place that make the same trip on the same ship. So we must push one common intention. It's for a better life in the region for we woman and we children.